Good day, everybody. My name is Deacon Derek Walcott. I'm a permanent deacon in the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. And you know, every week we have conversations with Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. But you know something? This is a special week for that gentleman, you know. Yeah, special week. But it was his birthday. He was celebrating his 33rd anniversary of ordination as a priest. So it's a big time. You know, it's a big time and we're, we're going to have a nice conversation with him. But happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Archbishop. Happy birthday to you. Well, let's roll it out now and find out what's happening in his corner. Welcome, Archbishop Jay. How are you? I'm doing really well, Deacon. What about you? I'm very good. Very good. This is great news. Great news indeed. And we really had a wonderful celebration. It was your birthday. Your, 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 also, you celebrated your anniversary and you ordained. You ordained a young man to the priesthood on the same day that you were ordained to the priesthood. On St. Yeah. Joseph's Day. Big day. That's right. Yeah, and our Catholic men's ministry also celebrated too on that day. So it was really a wonderful time. A a really happening. great plenty of things happening um you know as we're getting ready and getting ready for this beautiful holy week and so i see a topic this week is all about opening up our spiritual toolkit so you know i had to prepare for you i mean i just couldn't just come with my hands swinging so i'll bring out a toolkit a hammer behind your head yes you know, a man who about him, everything looked like a nail. <laughs> yeah, everything looked like a nail. Oh, Lord. So, Archbishop Ji, you know, I'm rolling out the question this week. What toolkit do we need for this new operating system upgrade? You know, we've been talking about an operating system upgrade, you know, um, Synod, um, where the Spirit is leading us. He's the protagonist. You know, synod, you know, just journeying together. But you, you, you said that, you know, it's all about an operating system and we need to get an upgrade. So let's dive into this thing. Let's dive into opening up our spiritual toolkit. So, what toolkit? I work with a, a manual toolkit, you know, the normal toolkit that every tradesman knows. So, what's this new toolkit we'll need for this new operating system upgrade? Well, We've seen in the last few weeks, the Pope Francis has been inviting us to think synodality. And synodality is about how are we walking together as church? And I use the image of upgrading your operating system in your phone, your op so your OS upgrade in your phone, in your computer. Everybody at some stage, you either do an OS upgrade and it's painful and sometimes it's loading, 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 and it's taking forever. Sometimes you do the upgrade and it crash. Sometimes you do the upgrade and all the functionality you knew by heart, now they move it and put it somewhere else. And you have to learn a whole new way of doing this thing on the same piece of equipment you had. It's just different. And that's what synodality is like inside of the church. So we, we, I use the image of, of it being an operating system upgrade because it's changing the way we are doing church, the way we're relating as church. And uh, Pope Francis has, has proposed for the church that this is really a new way of being church today. Many people have feared that this is a, a sneaky um, way of... of trying to change the church's fundamentals, trying to change its doctrine, trying to change its rules, trying to change its morals. And, and that's been the big fear. And I, I don't know if you have listened to any um, any of the media yeah. about yeah. Synod and synodality. Of course. I mean, you, you know, you just listen outside there and you listen to the media and they have their agenda to push, you see? So they come up with, boy, the Pope changing everything, you know? I um, mean, and, and it's... it's I just don't want to get into it, but we've heard so many negative things about people. And, they, you know, you know, Trinese, you know, people of the world, 
they don't they didn't read the document but they're ready to assume that the document is saying this and it didn't say this and it's saying uh, the other correct so in a, in our in this this move of pope francis you know all the fears about new doctrine new rules new morals all, all of these fears you know it's not true it's just not true in fact the operating system of grade does not even touch directly any of those things what it does is gives us another way to do what Vatican II asks us to do. And that is to be the people of God journeying together towards Christ or the church as a family of families journeying together towards Christ. It gives us that relational aspect of the church that the church is more relational. It gives us that. It, it gives us a way of, of experiencing church different. So what the new OS upgrade really is given to us is given us a way of being church. That's what is given, a new way of being church. And I would say a much better way of being church. But you know, I, I just want to chime in here about, about Vatican II, because Vatican II was like in the 60s. So we're dealing with 1960. And you know, we only now flipping the switch for the for the OS upgrade. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so we, the church hasn't changed anything, you know, in terms of its doctrine, its values, and so on, and what Jesus taught. But yes. it's it's now a new relationship way of sharing sharing and communicating to everybody you know this beautiful way once we agree that the whole people are got on on pilgrimage together towards the kingdom then we have to set a course now towards that and then once we set that course then we have to ask what tools do we need to ensure we get there this course, as we have seen over the last few weeks, it has many, many implications. And the first implication is that the people of God have the capacity to discern God's will in things both big and small. That, that's, so synodality requires that, they, that every member of the people of God has that capacity of discernment. And that capacity of discernment in things big and small is that capacity to really be able to sense the will of God in, in, the, in the things in our life that are important, in the little things and the big things in our life. And how do we discern the, the, the will of God? Well, that's by the interior movements and dispositions. But, but that's an assumption of the upgrade of the Vatican II upgrade. That's an assumption. But the way we were operating the church did not use that model. So we did this big vision change with Vatican II, people of God, synodality, but we didn't have the, the, the skill set to, to back that up. And, and this is spelled out in a Vatican document on the International Theological Commission. Big words, census for day. Word of the day. Word of census the day. I love it. In the life of the church. Census for day in the life of the church. And here's what it has to say. By the gift of the Holy Spirit, the faithful have an instinct for the truth of the gospel which enables them to recognize and endorse authentic Christian doctrine and practice and to reject what is false. The supernatural instinct intrinsically linked to the gift of faith received in the communion of the church is called the census for day. And it enables Christians to fulfill their prophetic calling. Now, you see what you just said there? Now, I have had some conversations with people. And they say, what the common man in the street could teach, could teach, you know, the, the bishop or the priest? You know, and that was an interesting comment. 
you know mm -hmm. but but these fellas they did their theology and you know what i mean some of them have their doctorates and their phds and the the the, the bachelors and the masters that's where we should be getting all the information from. So why are you taking it? Why are you asking the common man, you know, to have a, this conversation? I just then, you know. Or the common woman. Or the common woman. When granny give you a, a parable, or granny quote one of the folk sayings for you, you already sort out your head before you even have time to 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 make another move, you know. When you know, and 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 that's the wisdom sayings of 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 our people, and and the, our grandmothers had a tremendous capacity for wisdom sayings, and for for naming something with a very pity little saying that put a, a interpretation on it that that if you didn't hear it, well, boy, you know, if the caps fit, pull the string. Yeah. I mean, and there's so many beautiful sayings that, you know, you would hear from your grannies or your uncles and so on that made so much sense, you know. I, I mean, one that we, we talked about so many times on this show is it takes a village to raise a child. Right. You know, just think about that. Right. And and the, the sense of the faithful is is also uh, a sense as it's called here, it enables Christians to fulfill their prophetic calling. Because each Christian has received the Holy Spirit, each one has a sense of the truth of the gospel, which enables them to recognize and endorse authentic Christian doctrine and practice. And, you know, if you take something like the charismatic renewal as a, a great example, back in the day, in the early 1970s, that was not received by the official of the church. You know? I remember that. It was the people, it was the, it was the ordinary people who received charismatic renewal as an authentic expression of Christian living and of Christian spirituality. And, and because it was received by the ordinary people, it spread like wildfire throughout the archdiocese. It was the, the abbot at the time, and it was the archbishop at the time who gave it cover. And many of the priests thought that this was an aberration of, of Catholicism. Many, 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 and fought at, against it. But the sense of the people prevailed, and it, it, it's become like grass throughout the whole, like throughout the whole church. It's just everywhere. That's, that's one, one example. The, the uh, popular religiosity is another, is another example, that where you see popular religiosity emerge, then you have a sense of the faithful, about that as a, a authentic movement of the spirit towards God from this culture. So those are some of the things that, you know, where the sense of the faithful prevails. But what the document is saying is that each Catholic has a sense that is guided by the Holy Spirit. And if we listen carefully to that, we will also find a way forward towards where we as church need to be. Well, you know, I, I know this calls for a deep sense of listening. And I guess that's where you're going with this toolkit. I, I know you're going with somewhere with this toolkit, but it calls for a deep, for me, a deep, sincere um, listening to what each other is saying, because you know we did we did those three steps last week, where we talked about the I, we talked about the you, and we talked about the we. Now that takes a lot of discipline, you know. Yep, yep, yep. But you know, if we take the sense of the faithful as a foundation, 
then we need to see the Holy Spirit as a protagonist for the church as a whole. And we need to see the Holy Spirit working through each member of the church, but also working through the hierarchy, working through our normal structures, working through the liturgy, working through our, our formation processes. And, and we have to remember it is the Holy Spirit that does the formation for us. We have to remember that. And so as we, as we remember that, then now we start to understand where we, where we really are. So the Holy Spirit is the protagonist that is moving the church from each faithful Catholic and from the whole of the, of the church. Moving both in the in the hierarchy in the Petrine office and in granny and grandson, all through the church. Yeah, but I I, I see I see you, you you made a special note there. You had a sentence there that I loved. You say the Holy Spirit is not automatic in us. <laughs> Where are you going with that one? No, 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 it can't be automatic because the same way that we have. Adam and Eve saying no to God, the same way we can say no to God. And, and the, we often say no to God. We often curtail the action of the Holy Spirit in us. Because of free will, the work of the Holy Spirit can't be seen as an automatic thing in us, not necessarily taking us where we need to go to listen to the Holy Spirit in a more consistent and in a deeper way, that's the first and the most important tool in our toolkit. We have to learn how to listen and how to obey the Holy Spirit in our life. Asking for some impossible things here. We don't even listen to anybody except ourselves. Remember we spoke about monologue and the deaf? <laughs> we are we suffering from like the death. I know you like that one. I love it. I always use it. <laughs> I know you like that one. But can you imagine what it would be like if we become more attuned to listening to the Holy Spirit? Could you imagine what it would be like if every Catholic became more attuned to listening to the Holy Spirit, allowing the Spirit to do in us whatever the Spirit wants? Can you imagine how, how, how amazing that would be? That's, that's where this toolkit is going to move the church. And that's what synodality is asking for the church. Because only when we listen to the action of the Holy Spirit in us deeply, will we find a way to give God what God is asking, things big and small. And that, that's really the... Um, the first tool I want to see, the tool of listening to the Holy Spirit and acting on the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Boy, you better get into this toolkit. Eh? I'm just letting you know, you see this, this thing, be, a toolkit could be real heavy. You understand? A toolkit for a tradesman. Now, I carry around a toolkit. Eh? So you see the one in the back there? That's mine. So a toolkit could be a heavy thing to carry along. So I want you to dive into this toolkit and you have different levels in that toolkit. Eh? So if you think about uh, uh, like the toolkit you have behind, would you put the, the hammer on the top shelf? Yeah, you mash up the toolkit. The hammers must always go at the bottom. Right. So your heavier and your bigger tools go down below. Then you have your middle order tools that come in the middle. And then you have your top level tools that is your more everyday stuff. That, that usually goes to the top of the toolkit. Things you're just going to reach in, a pliers, a, a screwdriver, Allen key, uh, uh, you know, the things that you're going to be reaching for more often kind of goes, goes on the top. So if you think of the toolkit as, as a three level toolkit, at the top level of the toolkit, what we have are the daily tools for sustaining our spiritual life was that you know the early church condenses into four devotions which is acts 242 they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to the fellowship to the breaking of the bread 
and to the prayer. And these four devotions formed the church to be missionary. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were destined to be saved, Acts 2.47. So the, the, the top level of the toolkit has the four devotions. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and to the prayer. Four devotions. That's, that's, that's right at the top level. You're reaching for those on a daily basis. Because if you're devoted to something, it's something you're doing on a regular basis. You're not devoted to something and now and again I might. No, no, no. If you're devoted, it means on a regular basis. You are considering the teaching of the apostles. You're considering the fellowship or you're entering into the fellowship. The breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist and the prayer. Don't run away, you know. I don't want you to run away, you know, because you see this top level of this toolkit here. I had some conversations with people. And, you know, it's your fault. I put it straight on your fault, you know. You take us up into the upper room. You have people in the upper room now. You don't even want to come out of the upper room. You are not afraid to come to church. They don't want to church no more. It's your fault. I will blame it on COVID. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But these four levels of the two, these four devotions, these, this is the first level of tool in the toolkit. The four devotions formed the church to be a missionary church. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So it wasn't that mission was something that was done. Mission was something that was inherent in the church as it existed. As they, were dev as they lived their four devotions, the Lord was adding to their number. Yeah, yeah, like that. The four devotions, eh? They yes. devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, numero uno, to fellowship. Hey, people, you know as the fellowship, eh? To the breaking of the bread. Hey, guys, holy mass, holy mass. And to prayer, that must have happened daily, five times a day. You wake up in the morning, you get, hey, the archbishop, you know, he set me up, you know, he have me setting my alarm at six o'clock. 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock in the afternoon. He's a set up man, you know. He set me up. For the Angelus. <laughs> yes. For the Angela. So they are there for devotions. What is much more intriguing is the high quality of the fellowship of that, of that early church. It, it goes on to say, everyone was filled with awe are the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Acts 2, 43 to 47. I want you to hear how much relationship they had. Uh, how much relationship they had. So they met every day in temple courts. I, I, they broke bread together in their homes every day with sincere and glad heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of people. They were willing to sell possessions to support others. Everybody was filled with awe and wonder at the works and signs they performed. There was a lot of fellowship in the early church. A lot, a lot of fellowship. A, a lot of relationship that, that really gave this, this early church a deep sense of relationality. That, that this was a church where people related deeply with one another. To sell your possessions, to give to the church so that everybody could have what they need requires a lot of trust and relationship. He, listen, the man in the street say, will say, you had to be crazy. You want me, I had two flat screens in my house, right? I have a 50 or a 65 in my living room and I have a 50 in my bedroom. What are you trying to tell me? That I should give away one of them? Or, or, or I have a deep freeze. 
I'm not the priest, but, but my neighbor, you know, my neighbor might be eating. You know, at this relationship thing, what are you trying to say? That I should take out of my deep freeze and kind of, hey, birds. We have to be a little more relational, a little more conscious of being relational, a little more conscious of relationality. Because, you know, and we see that here, it, it seems that the early experience of church or Christian fellowship was given the part of a, a devotion because it was one of the four devotions. They were devoted to the fellowship. It was a devotion, you know. Again, again, yes. I hear the word, you know, the word is devotion. I heard the word. Fellowship. The Greek term for fellowship is koinonia, and it captures the sense of fellowship is a combination of community, of communion, of joint participation, of sharing intimacy together. It's a combination of all of that. But it, but it is us together. So it's something like, like when men lie men, you know? You get, a, you get a sense of fellowship. But this is liming with an added piece of connected deeply because we are all connected in Christ as part of his body. See what, what's happening right now is everybody building bigger bands. Eh? I just like, you know, be building bigger bands right now. Everybody in the corner and they say, hey, boy, things might happen. Let me build a bigger band. As opposed to living more honestly and openly. As opposed to that. So in the early church, this was a given because the society plays a very high value on community. Today, however, with the rise of individualism, we need tools for building fellowship. Before, in that, in that time, they would already be predisposed to fellowship and relationship. And the spirit would have taken it up. Today, we talked about this already. The average family does not experience fellowship. The average family does not sit together around a table to eat a meal. They don't have lime and time together. They don't hang out together and just waste time together having fun. They don't talk about things together and, and, and enter into, you know, normal, everyday conversations on a daily basis with each other. And if the family doesn't have it, where are the members of the family learning to do that? And, and, and how are they going to be able to do it in the church if, the, if it's not experienced in the family anymore? Toolkit. 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 Again, this whole individualism thing. You know what I mean? Uh, um, our whole world, our whole world centers on, you know, this thing. That is yeah. it. That's all it centers on this thing, you know, and therefore there's no more relationship. Um, it's a kind of relationship, there's a pseudo relationship, but not a real relationship. They don't touch you, feel you, you know what I mean? Hug up. It's it's not a line. It's not a line anymore. And we we were known for being good limers. But I mean. In Trinidad, you could have dropped into anybody's house at any time and unannounced. Today, you want to drop into somebody, you have to announce, call, check, make sure. But it, it's it's changed. But what is also changed is we no longer are a relational people and our people no longer have the formation for relationship which they used to have in the family and in the community and in the church a long time ago. And that, that's a game changer in every way possible. I'm scratching my head here now, you know. I'm going to scratch it. <laughs> scratch my head. But, but, you know, to me, it's still, it is still in our DNA to be like that, you know. I agree. But it is in our DNA to be that way. But we need some tools to help us 
rebuild what we used to have naturally at the same time. Because a synodal church is a relational church. And if you're not in deep relationship, and if you don't see relationship as important, then it's going to be a struggle. Dive into the toolkit. I, I, I'm dying. I want to hear the tools. Dive into the toolkit. Well, including in the toolkit at the top level must be growing people in relationship, in friendship, and bonds of love through their common identity as disciples and members of the body of Christ. And has to be there at the top level. And how do you do that? So people, today people talk about emotional intelligence. Well, we used to get that naturally from growing up in a family. Your you, you butt heads, you, you rub shoulders, you rub people wrong, they rub you wrong, and you grew up understanding how you forgive, how you relate, how you take setbacks, how you take um, negative emotions. You learn all of these things. Today, it doesn't seem like that's happening naturally. So that has to be in in included in the toolkit as a way where we learn these things more more um, more formally now than we ever had to learn it before but at this level of the toolkit we should also find the rosary the morning and evening prayer of the church christian meditation mass eucharistic adoration the examine of conscience and the other prayers of the church all of them are there in this toolkit because the four devotions is one part of it. And each devotion has tools required. So if you think of the teaching of the apostles, well, you need to have a tool for, for that. The fellowship, that needs some tools for us to learn how to be relational. The Eucharist, you have to, you have to, you need the, you, your daily missile to read your readings and prepare before going to mass. You, and then your other prayer that you that you do on a daily basis, which is a like the rosary and the morning and evening prayer, meditation, mass, Eucharistic adoration, all of these other things. So these are the, the tools in the toolkit. And you know the two I always promote the most. The Christian meditation and the examine. And I, I keep saying if, if, if a young person could be introduced to those two, it will hold them steady for a while to come. The rosary is always there. You, 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 you can't, that is a, one of the essential tools in that toolkit. You cannot have the rosary there. But, but, but these are the, 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 some of what I would call some of our top level tools. And if you if you want to talk about the um about the, the the teaching of the apostles, we have given every Catholic form.org. If you don't have it right now, just go onto your for, phone, put in form.org. And then they will ask you, will say, choose parish where you come from and choose Archdiocese, type in Archdiocese of Port of Spain. And, and then choose, it'll be a parish cluster that you're in. So choose, you'll see the parish cluster that you're in. And then from that, you will, you will be able to put in your email and they will sign you in. They have a variety of excellent teachings on all kinds of things that you could have at the palm of your hand anytime you want to, if you want uh, to do a little study on Mary. A study on any of the gospels, any of the letters of the church, uh, a study on any of the saints, beautiful stuff for kids, whatever you want. The teaching of the apostles, the tool for that, formed.org, F O R M E D.org. If you've not signed up, it, sign up it. We pay a subscription every year for every Catholic in the diocese to have full access to it for free. So sign up, use it. And then in July, August, you know, you run a pile of schools every year. Bible school, evangelization school, communication school, liturgy school, prayer. And, and, and those are solid parts of the teaching of the apostles. 
and the tools in that toolkit for that purpose. So there you go. So we just uh, we just we just finished with level one of the toolkit. That's just level yeah. one alone. All right. Yeah. You ready for level two? I'm ready for level two. But 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 here this level one was a a earful, a handful, a mouthful, and button absolutely necessary. People pick up your Catholic news sermon, please. Okay. And you're getting yeah. all of this rich teaching in your Catholic news. You could get it digitally or you could buy it, buy an extra copy, pass it on to your neighbor. Now. That's part of fellowship. That's part of the old fellowship thing. Yeah. Don't dive into the second level of this toolkit. Let me hear you now. Once people have the four devotions, at the next level, the tools are the tools of discernment. So all the tools on the top level was the four devotions. Eh? Okay. So a pile of tools for prayer, we heard those. The Eucharist, we heard that one. Fellowship, we heard that one. Teaching of the apostles, pile of tools for that. So each of the four have a pile of tools. So that's the top level of the toolkit. Now we're going down to the next level. And here we're dealing with tools of discernment. And, and these are bigger tools, you know? And, and these tools help us to use the tools in the top level. Eh? Communal discernment is founded on a deep prayer life and openness to the Holy Spirit. You can't come in and expect to start doing communal discernment if you are not in communion with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have an active prayer life yourself, and if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit in, in ways that are somewhat consistent. And so the, the, this is the genius of Pope Francis. To move the church to synodality, the whole church has to move to spiritual depth. Man is a genius. No wonder. You know, you, you know, you know people don't know he was a scientist. You know, he used to teach chemistry. So you see this thing? He understands, you know, yeah. how to do this thing. Yeah. So you have to get the spiritual depth to be able to start to get to the second level, which is discernment. And what that means is the church now is moving the individual to discipleship and to encounter with Jesus Christ. Just to get to the second level, which is discernment. Isn't that, a, isn't that brilliant? That requires a deeper life. That requires a deeper life. So the letter to St. John says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's what, that's what we're talking about. This is Testing this. every spirit. Testing yeah. every spirit. Yeah, I, I tell young people, listen, I say, you listen, they want to dive into this and dive into that. And I say, does it bring you closer to God? Does it mm -hmm. help you to love your neighbor more? Just, just work out these things. Test it. What are the fruits? What are the fruits? Test every spirit. Test every spirit. So as we go on, Father Peter MacIsaac has a couple of things to say about the toolkit. And about discernment, all processes of communal discernment are grounded in basic spiritual principles, and these are related to various forms of personal discernment as well. So communal discernment is rooted in personal discernment. That's rooted in ways of praying. So the examine is a form of daily discernment. The review of prayer is a form of discernment after a method of prayer. I often ask people to do a review of a retreat or even a life review where you look at your whole life. In all of these exercises, there is a discernment going on. There is an attentiveness to the presence of the Holy Spirit, an awareness of how that presence had an interior effect on me, consolation or desolation, and an interpretation of what these interior movements might mean. 
the examine of consciousness creates an ongoing habit of discernment. The presence of the activity of the Holy Spirit becomes to the fore of the mind and heart of the Catholic. Before you go on, before I, I want you to talk about consolation and desolation, right? Mm. You see, in the presence of the Spirit, an awareness of how that presence has, you know, and the interpretation of what, you know, has a, this effect on us, you know, because when you're having conversations with the Spirit, you know, um, in, in the first part of it, you know, you, 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 you've taken the passage of Scripture, you look at what we are supposed to be discussing or what is the theme. And you're praying and you're, you're, you're asking for discernment and you're right on, okay, this is what I am hearing the Spirit say, okay? But then in the second level now, you're listening. You're listening to what the other is saying. But what you're saying is, hello, there may be, um, you know, a kind of a movement and it will be consolation or desolation. Explain that because many people ask, but well, what's this consolation and desolation? What does that mean? Question. You know, if ever you know a spiritual setting and you just feel full, you just feel full. That's probably the best word. Um, at the at the slightest level of it, it's just feeling a sense of mm, all is well. At the slightest level, where you you're not feeling any big wow or big happy or or but just a, a deep sense of contentment that where you are is where you need to be. And it is a connection with the Holy Spirit that helps you to understand that the Spirit is active here and now. So in, in even our conversation here, there were moments when the Spirit was active in the conversation, when you felt a movement, an interior movement. And 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 the consolation feels more like wow yeah this makes sense it feels more like a, a fullness inside it feels more like a calmness what does desolation feel like like the light has been out like the air is sucking out of the room like there's there's no energy or like no this is this, this is really terrible and bad. When you, when you feel the good spirit or the bad spirit, you feel consolation and desolation. And once you interpret them for what they really are, that gives you a sense of not only where the Holy Spirit is, but where the Spirit is prompting you to move or prompting the group as a collective to move also. You know, I just had a... Um... I just said, well, over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing um, exercises with the Holy Faith, Holy Faith ladies. And then I did I did one this weekend with Agape House, you know, and I remember one of them saying, boy, you see this thing, I have a consolation kind of mo a moment here that we not, um, we feel guilty because guess what? You know, the average age here is 65. So how come... How come we don't have young people? You know, are we reaching out to them? You know, and somehow, you know, that was a kind of consolation kind of moment for them. You know, you say, but mm -hmm. wow, age 65, you know, and where the young people, or how are we communicating with young people to invite them in? And all of this trying to discern, you know, something not right here. You know, something is not right here. And especially when somebody said, well, why don't we use technology to try and draw them in, you know? So they had all of these kind of features in terms of this con conversation. So I, I would say when they realize that something is not right here, that would be a moment of desolation. Right, right. Because yeah. the absence of the Holy Spirit moving. Now, having recognized that, when they start speaking now about where the Spirit is leading, well, we could use technology, we could do this, we could do that, then they will feel a sense of consolation. So that, that's usually how the, the Holy Spirit would move. First, there would be a sense of desolation when you come face to face with the fact that where you are is not where God wants you to be. And that's the, that's the cause of the desolation, is the space between where you are and where God is asking. 
And the consolation comes from shifting yourself into the direction of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you got it. So all you, you, you just got the, 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 the consolation and the desolation part of this conversation. Right? So I think that people, that cleared up a lot for people. So, you know, the examine of consciousness creates an ongoing habit of discerning the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit. And if you would pray that every single day, you would start in the day to have this sense of where the Spirit is prompting you and learning to actually, you know, give in to the nudge of God in the midst of your day. You're challenging people to bend my heart to your will, oh Lord. You know, I, I know that's where you're going. You know, that you, I know that you, I know that you kind of that's your operating, your operating system. <laughs> bend my heart to your will, oh Lord. Go in there. I've done there already. That's not a journey. That's we done reached our destination already. At the second level, ought to be Lexio Divina, listening to Christ in the Scriptures, and the examine of consciousness to consciously reflect on the movements of the good and the bad spirits during that day and how they shaped our response in our listening, in our discernment, in our fellowship. When we become aware of the movement of the spirit in our daily life, we will become aware of it in our group conversation generally and in conversation in the spirit more specifically. So you see how the tools in the toolkit are working both on the individual life, but also at the collective, at the group, at the whole parish, whole community, that, that it, it's, it's all inter, in, intertwined with each other. But it is by using the tools that we come to experience what is fullness of love. And the, and the presence, the in the presence of God. I just want to tell people, look, this is not a one and done thing. Eh? This is a continuous process. I mean, you don't do it once as you have it, you know, because no. we are not like that. You understand? We, remember, we have a free will, eh? and you have yeah. to be open to that movement. And, and the more we immerse ourselves in the spiritual and in the word of God and in the toolkit, the more it becomes obvious what we actually need from God. We regularly using the tools of discernment move us from the rung of a mere Christian to a disciple seeking God's will in all things. Little and big things, we're still seeking God's will. So once we start regularly using the second level of discernment, we, we moved significantly in discipleship and start to be able to hear and listen to God in whatever God is asking of us. I think that that too is very important. Yep. And that's why I've asked the Catholic schools and the altar servers groups and the confirmation classes. I've asked them, you know, and the youth groups to practice Christian meditation and the examine every single day together with a, a daily sacrifice, which they promise to me that they will promise they will do every single day. Imagine that, every single day. If we can get, beautiful. yeah, if we could get, if we could get them on that level, you know, to be faithful to this practice, you could imagine what these amazing young people will grow up to be as adults. Yeah, yeah. It's a game changer, a game changer. A game changer. Game changer. So if we go now to the third level, so the first level are the personal prayers of devotions, the four devotions that we have, and, and all the tools around that. The second level is all about discernment and discernment of spirits, the movement of spirits in my soul, in our group, in, in our collective. Now, now we go on to the, to the third level. And every good toolkit has three levels at least. And here the big tools are put in now at the bottom of the toolkit. Here we have the conversation in the Holy Spirit, which was outlined in my last week's column. It, it is the bigger, the biggest, and the most 
formal tool that we will have in this toolkit, eh? the conversation in the spirit. And if you remember last week, we talked about the three rounds in the conversation in the spirit. The first round is the I, where I come with a discernment based on the materials and my prayer. Second round is you. What did I hear you say that moved me interiorly? And the third round is, is the we. What did we want to, how do we want to collect this information? And how do we make it ours as we're leading this church at this time? And so we, we are moving now to a third level of the toolkit. And that I think is important. It's pulled out when there is a need for formal discernment in a group on a specific matter. The other tools on this level, and everything does not require conversation in the spirit. I want to say that like, everything does not require conversation in the spirit. We are emphasizing it a lot now because we want it to become co-natural and second, second to thinking and in some time to come. But we, we don't see this as the only tool in the kit. There are plenty of tools inside of this kit. This is a well-populated toolkit. I like that. I'm going to use the hammer. <laughs> no, no, no. What I mean by that is, you know, some people will say, listen, you have a nail popping out, out of a floorboard here. Well, let me have a conversation with the spirit. What? Boy, take the hammer and pump the nail down and done this story. That's what you're talking about. Not everything has to have this elaborate conversation with the spirit. There are some things that you can deal with. Oh, the nail out of the floorboard, if somebody okay. could trip on it, boy, pull the hammer and pump. And if it's a screw, you pull out your screwdriver. Correct. If it's a bolt, I see you have a whole metric set behind you. I see you have a level. I see you have pliers. It's all there. Parish councils or group may use a simple conversation on a matter on the agenda. Like today, we had a, a meeting looking at formation. And we, we went in and we did a little historical view of it. We looked at some um, experiences that are really novel in the contemporary. And then we said, okay, what is the spirit saying to us? And, and as we continue the sharing, there was a discernment around what we needed to do that became clearer and clearer. And, and that wasn't a conversation in the spirit. Yesterday, I had a finance meeting and we, had, we were discussing a very troubling matter. That matter, I did up a, a page and a half matter for discernment and sent it to the five people in the meeting. And when we met in the meeting, we did a, a formal conversation in the spirit. Round one, round two, round three. And at round three, we had a we. We had three things that we're going to do that we all moved away from that meeting, knowing that that will be, that's how we're going to move forward. So there are many tools in the toolkit. So you might start a conversation in a parish council. And in the midst of that conversation, you might realize there's a lot more energy than you thought. Um, you didn't see it coming. But, but then, you know, what you do next? So here yeah, you could just take a pause, which I did today in, 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 in the meeting. and say, let's just pause and ask the Lord to show us what is he doing and what is the way forward here? And out of that, a whole new energy emerged in the meeting. And, and that's when we realize that God is actually here. But it also pulls wisdom out from the Holy Spirit on, on, onto the matter for discernment. And, and this may lead to new insights and to a, a whole other way of being. Perspectives start changing. Matters start resolving because we're now listening and cooperating with God. So what I would say is, if you're having a normal conversation in a meeting and it really becomes clear that this is a special topic because of emotion and because of other things, 
then the simple thing to do is slow it down, take the pause, and bring it down at the end to a beautiful statement about, about it that comes out of, a, out of a consensus. Then you start to feel the consolation. You feel it. You feel that consolation. But if it doesn't come to a conclusion, you pause and say, okay, the next time we meet, we're putting this top of the agenda. So and so, would you prepare a one page on this first that we could consider it deeply in our prayer? And then the next time you come, you do it as a formal conversation in the spirit. But but you can use an informal. I found the informal to work really well in a number of situations. So usually I find new insights come, new perspectives come. Matters get resolved. And, and, and if they don't get resolved, we have a new way of approaching the, res the, the resolution of the matter. And I think that that's what is really, really con important. So I like the informal conversation because I use that a lot. It uses the same second level skills of discernment interior movement, consolation, and desolation of the group prompting of the Holy Spirit, and the, the sensing, the communion in that group, is, which is a sign that the Spirit is present. It should be prepared for with a one-page document on the matter for discernment and the formal prayer of the participants beforehand. So if, if you are doing the matter for discernment, as a conversation spread is a formal preparation. If it just pops up, you just give in to it and you 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 work with it and, and let it flow as it flows. You call that the informal. That's the informal. That's informal. Good. Now most of our meetings begin with, with Lexio Divina or some similar integrated prayer into our meeting so that the Bible animates the pastoral life of the church. At this level, the tool must be suitable and it must suit the task that you're entering into that group, that meeting for. I mean, many, many times, Lexio Divina, you do it in the beginning and you have a great Lexio Divina and then somewhere in the middle of the meeting, you, you're struggling through something. You say, but wait, hold on a second. Um, didn't we talk about this in the Bible reading? And then you're pulling an insight from the Bible reading straight back into the matter that you're talking about now and it's shedding light for you there and then. So that's also a, a, another part of the toolkit. You're also bringing in here now families. I see you say yeah. families may be stuck on a specific point and yeah. use the formal conversation in the spirit or around, yeah. around a dining table you know what I mean? You, but you could use an employee okay. more flu, fluid listening to right. not the cell phones. So, and, and a, if there's something that becomes a matter on the table, is you just pause and say, all right, let, let's all pause for a moment. Just, just pause, close your eyes, pray and ask the Lord to give you some insight. And, and then you say, okay, what did you hear when you prayed? And, and things will start emerging. Okay. What what is it really on the on your heart here? And and as you listen, you'll also hear what the spirit is doing in moving that matter into into some form of communion, some form of of resolution. But they could also pause and decide that each person takes a matter to prayer and using the examine as a way of praying for the next week on this matter. And, and to just to see what the Holy Spirit is speaking to each member of the family. Remember, this is a family thing now. And at the end of the week, they come together, they pray and they share on the fruits of each person's discernment and then come to a resolution as a family. So these are different tools that could be used at the different levels, at the level of the group, at the level of the archdiocese, at the level of the family. So I want you to think about a toolkit, not just a single tool. Many people, you know, I pray my rosary and I got 
Now, but we have a whole variety of tools. Remember, for a man with a hammer, everything started to look like a nail, you know. <laughs> everything started to look like a nail. You know, he terrorizes me because behind me is my the main, the main tool is the hammer. I'm a ball of pliers, I have, you know what I mean? I suck it sets. I suck over, the next few years, over the next few years, we need to help all disciples and leaders to build out their toolkit and become comfortable using toolkits appropriately so that each tool has an appropriate use and you don't use a screwdriver as if it's a hammer and you don't use a hammer as if it's a screwdriver. So we learn how to use it appropriately and in the right time and season also. Amen. What a teaching today. I, I think I, I like the, the whole method of using a toolkit. So, but you need to, you need to pray with us on this one, you know. We need to get Absolutely. a prayer. Absolutely. Father, you have given us many, many, many valuable tools for the building of your kingdom here on earth. For us to be disciples, for us to discern together, for us to pray together and come to your will. We ask that you sharpen these tools and sharpen our way of understanding them and give us a better grace in using them. That as we learn to use these tools more skillfully, we may learn the art of discernment. We may learn the art of listening to you, O oh God, and that we may put ourselves clearly in your hands so that you can lead and guide us as you would want. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop G. Well, again, earlier, again, earlier in the next step, eh? by a Catholic news. Have a blessed day. Hey, Palm Sunday that's coming a, up. Wait, that's a tool in the toolkit. Eh? <laughs> that is a tool in the toolkit, the Catholic news. Thanks God so much, Archbishop you. G. God bless you. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody, and happy Holy Week. God bless everybody.